got folks watching us as we live stream. We know they're watching us from India. We know we got folks watching us in England. We got folks watching us in the states and outside of the states. <clears throat> and um, but I had already determined I was going to say this, and then my wife yesterday said, "Would you please do this?" And so we're going to tag team it. You know, in a country it seems as equally divided as the United States no matter what happens 50% are going to shout and 50% are going to cry and um, but when we were in prayer in the back room I had a thought come to me really quick and I had to write this down and so I want you to listen to me when I say this diversity of thought is not dangerous to relationship when there's unity of purpose did you hear that? That diverse thought is not dangerous when there's unity of purpose. But when there's diversity of purpose, unity of thought is commanded. But as long as we're of one mind concerning purpose, you know, the Bible says if a house is divided against itself, and that's speaking of purpose, it cannot, it has two different objectives as the house of God we allow diversity of thought because we are of unity in purpose and our purpose is that Christ be glorified in all things and at all times so I want to say that again and under this applies to every relationship in your life Diversity of thought is not dangerous when there's unity of purpose. And I also want to say this, you know, when the Lord brought the disciples into the Jesus Christ school of prayer, he said, when you pray, say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Notice what he did not say. He did not say, my will be done, my kingdom come, in heaven as it is on earth. Y'all following me? There are some times, and I'm going to wander a little bit. You remember there's a story when the children of Israel were on a God ordained mission and they were going into a city called Jericho and before they got to Jericho Joshua spotted a man standing at the gate with a sword and Joshua went up to the man and he said are you with us or are you with our enemies y'all y'all know the story God ordained mission are you with us or are you with the enemy God ordained mission are you with us or are you with our enemy and the response was, neither. I have come as the captain of the Lord's army. See, there is a possibility that it ain't our side or their side he's on, but he's on his side. And so what we need to do, instead of making him conform to our will, we conform ourselves to his will. And our prayer is at all times in all things, Thy will be done. So we're going to pray because it's already started. Houses dividing. And no matter which way you go, there's going to be unrest. But not so in the house of God. This is our opportunity to shine. This is our opportunity to show that there is a unifying force that's greater than all division. It's greater than all diversity, that unifying force is love that has been shed abroad in our heart by Jesus Christ. So love, you're going to lead us in prayer. You said to have us pray in tongues, so do it. No, you don't need to talk about it. You need to just lead us. Pray. So I don't know what to say. You pray. don't need to preach. That's my job. You pray. Oh, I am definitely not the preacher. So, Lord, I just praise you, Father. 
that unity, Lord, is brought to our nation. Thank you, Father. Let's everyone pray together. Come on. Hallelujah. I just want to say one thing, love, if you don't mind, please. Uh, what You're came to timer. me is right now is the most important time for us to pray in our heavenly language. Mm -hmm. Because in our heavenly language, the Holy Spirit prays for God's perfect will. When we don't know what to pray for, the Holy Spirit uses our spirit and our tongue for us to release God's plan in the earth. And right now is the most valuable time for us to pray in our mm. heavenly language because we don't know what to pray, right? Thank you, Jesus. The Holy Spirit will reveal things, and he'll, he'll send people, and he'll, he'll, he'll begin to do things, and, and the Lord depends on our prayer language. So when you're, when you're cooking, when you're shaving, when you're putting on your makeup, all the time try to just keep praying in tongues, just keep praying on the inside. When you're laying there about to go to sleep, just pray in tongues because that's going to be the exact prayer to pray for right now. And I was telling what, what, thought, what the thought came to me is many times when we had pressurized times in our ministry, in our life over the years, it's not the time to, to try to be afraid, but it's the time to push forward. And, and that means you see God as your victory. You see God as your refuge, that God is fighting for you. And he's moving for you in your behalf. And so we don't, we don't, you know, quiver, but we push forward. And then with that is your, in your prayer language and also praising him during this time because that means, God, you're my source. God, you're the one that's taking care of, of me and my family and my friends and my job and also our nation in the upstate in, this, in the, you know, in the Carolinas. And you know what I'm saying? So we, we keep our focus on him. And so in these times is when you push forward, you don't withdraw, right? And, and you hear all this stuff around you, and you'll hear stuff, but you don't listen to that. You push forward. Who is your God? He split the Red Sea. And I thought about the uh, children of Israel when they were the Pharaoh and the armies. They chased them, right? And then and the, and the Jews were leaving. They were leaving. And all of a sudden, they were being pursued by the army, right? They were being pursued, and they came all the way to the Red Sea, and they couldn't go any further. Look at this. They came all the way forward, and they couldn't go anymore. This was it. They're finished. The army's coming. They're coming in, and they're going to kill them. You know what I mean? It's like all this fear. But what happened is Moses put his arms up, and they said, God is faithful, and he said, step forward. And what did they do when they stepped forward? It started, it started splitting, right? And then it split, and then it was like the big walls, and then, woo, and then it's dry land. They didn't sit there and walk in mud, I don't think. I think it was dry land. How long was that river, love? How long was it? I woo, I love the Red Sea story. It gets me excited. It really does. Woo, yeah, it gets me excited. So then, I'm sorry, I'm taking away. Please I forgive know. me. I got to thinking about it. Woo. The devils, are, or the, the Pharaoh and the army, they're pursuing him. Y'all excuse my English. I'm just being here normal, right? Woo, they're pursuing. And, and then they just step across into the thing, and then the, and then the Lord splits the Red Sea. It really happened. It really did. There's evidence of, of wheels being covered. In, that are, they found them in the coral. One of my daddy's friends is a, is a scientist, and she went over there, a marine scientist, and she said they x-rayed the coral over there in the Red Sea, and they found inside the coral wheels that were covered up with coral. So it really did happen. They were annihilated. What happened is they walked across, and when they got all the way to the other side, then the river went, Psh! and what happened? Pharaoh and all of them lost it, right? And the children of Israel were on the other side. And God took care of them, right? So we go forward with God, and he's the one that paves the pathway. Okay, so then we pray in tongues, right? Let's pray in our heavenly language. And we pray the word of God. And we praise God because we have the victory. Hallelujah. Okay, so now I got that out finally. Whew. So, Lord, we just praise you, Father, for the victory. Thank you, Lord, that you're with us. Father, if, if God be for us, who can be against us? Nobody can stand against us. So, Father, we lift our nation up to you. Lord, we praise you, Father. Your kingdom come, Lord. We're going to pray what Jesus prayed. Your kingdom come, Lord. Your will be done, Lord, in our country. Lord, in our government, Father, as it is in heaven, Lord. 
Your kingdom come. Your kingdom touch. Your kingdom touch. Your kingdom touch. Your kingdom touch. Hallelujah. Your light, Father. Thank you, Father. You take care of it, Lord. We put our nation, Lord, in your hands. We thank you, Father. You've got it all under control, Lord. We praise you, Father. Hallelujah, Lord, that you bring peace, Lord, to our lands, Lord. Hallelujah. We praise you, Father, that you strengthen, Lord. You strengthen, Lord. You give wisdom, Father, where there needs to be wisdom, Lord. We thank you, Father, for taking care of the enemy's plans, Lord. We thank you for annihilating the enemy's plans, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord, just like you did, Lord, when Pharaoh pursued and his army pursued your children, Lord, we ask you, God, that you take care of what the enemy's doing, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Sick them, Lord. Get a hold of them, Father. You take care of it. Lord, we ask for your plan. Father, you help them to cross, go across the, the, the Red Sea. And, Lord, we thank you that you help our country, Lord, go across to the other side. Thank you, Father, for your blessings, Lord, on our country. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You, Father. Jesus is Lord over our nation. Hallelujah. Jesus is Lord over our nation. And we thank you, Father, that the gospel will be preached and will be sent Throughout the world, and there will be no hindrances, Father. We thank you, Lord, that there will be a free, a free flow of finances and money, Lord, into your kingdom, Father. Lord, we thank you that this is the last days, and we're going to be a part of the great harvest. And we thank you, God, that souls are coming in, Lord. We thank you that souls are coming in, God. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. Your will is done, Lord, in the earth as it is in heaven, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. It's always a dangerous thing to give her the mic. Hallelujah, Father. All right, we'll receive our offering at the end of the message. I want to go ahead and go right into the word. And uh, so this morning, it's my desire and hope that we'll be able to finish up the uh, series, Let the King Do His Thing. And um, this is part three of a message that was supposed to only be one part. And I think we'll finish it up today. So if you're ready for the word, say amen. amen. We're going to start with Luke chapter 12, verse 32. And I'm going to read it to you out of the Passion Translation. And I'm not going to go over a lot of the things that we've already said. If you've not, been, if you've not heard the messages, go, go to our YouTube channel or our um, website and you can get them there. And um, it would be good for you to familiarize yourself with what's already been said. But Luke chapter 12, verse 32, the Passion Translation says, So don't ever be afraid, dearest friends. Your loving Father joyously gives you his kingdom realm with all its promises. And then Luke chapter 22, verse 29, out of the English Standard, Jesus said, And I assign to you, as my Father assigned to me, a kingdom. Now I want to ask you, how many of you, and I need a show of hands, how many of you believe the word? Just what it says. How many of you know the Bible doesn't need to be explained away and we don't need to use theory to depower, de-energize the word, just let the Bible say what the Bible says, right? So Jesus said again, he said, I assign to you as my father assigned to me a kingdom. We have what he had, and we, we, I, I already said I'm not going to rehearse a lot of things, but the Bible talks about us being joint heirs, jointly 
together heirs with Christ. And what I told you this was this, that the impact of that reality is that Christ tied his inheritance to my inheritance. And that the only way I can be denied is if he be denied, because we're joint heirs. This has got to really sink in that I am not striving to obtain apart from him. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not out here trying to make it work by my own intellect and through my own faith. In fact, like Paul, we don't even live by our own faith. But the life that we live, because we've been crucified with Christ, the life that we now live, we live through and by the faith of the Son of God. Are y'all here this morning? I know we're few in number, but just say amen so I know you're here. That the faith that I have is not my version. In fact, next week I'm going to preach a new series entitled Faith Works. Because the faith that we have is the faith of God. It's not an imitation. It's not part two. It's not 2.0. It's His faith. And so we are in the world a representation of what Jesus was because he was our model. And we need to discard that religious thought that every time something good is said about a Christian, they say, well, that was Jesus. No, even as he is, so am I in this earth, in this world. Amen. So let's just quit explaining away and this is a novel thought. What if believers simply believed? Right? I mean, it ought not to be hard for a believer to believe because that's what makes us a believer is that we believe. What do we believe? Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. If God says it, we believe it. That's what makes us a believer. So we don't entertain the thought of people who are educated beyond their intellect and try to explain away how according to dispensations or the changing of ages that this was done away with or that was done away with and God no longer does miracles and now we're not what we were because the church has already been founded. That's highly educated nonsense. If he changeth not, then he cannot change. If he's, come on now, y'all, if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, there is no shadow of turning in his nature or his character, then how can he have changed? Right? So when Jesus says, I'm giving to you what was given to me, a kingdom was given to me, when Pilate said, are you a king, and I know I've already paraphrased this, Jesus didn't deny it. Jesus, in essence, said, you got that right, dude. And if I wanted, I could call down 12 legion of angels and wipe out every one of y'all. I have a kingdom, but my kingdom is not of this earth. But he was a king. He was given a kingdom, and so were we. Is that all right? Now, one of the things that we need to say when it comes to walking in what God has ordained us to be. There is something really important that we have to do. In fact, we must do it. Everyone say must. We must acknowledge what we are and what is ours in Him. I want to say that again. We must acknowledge what we are and what is ours in Him. In Philemon chapter 1, verse 6, and there's only one chapter, so it should not be hard for you to find, the sixth verse, reading it to you out of the New American Standard, I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge, and the King James Version says acknowledging, right, which means to accept and admit. Y'all following me? To acknowledge means to accept and admit. I acknowledge whatever it was that I accept. The spirit of faith is not a silent spirit. I'm trying to lay in some groundwork. We believe and therefore we speak. There is no such thing as biblical faith that is quiet. 
In fact, the Bible pays to silent faith um, the greatest of criticisms. It ignores it. The Bible doesn't talk about silent faith. From the beginning to the end, biblical faith is a faith that speaks. It says what it accepts. You're following me. And so Philemon said that I pray that the, the communication or the fellowship, the working of your faith, when you share your faith with another, whether it be speaking the goodness of God into the broken of the heart or the praying for needs and seeds and everything else, that the communication, the going back and forth of your faith, that it would become effective. Everyone say effective. Don't you want to be effective in your spiritual walk? How many of you enjoy praying ineffective prayers? How many of you enjoy ineffective worship services? No. In everything we do, we want it to be effective. We want it to have an impact. So the Holy Spirit, through Paul, in the letter to Philemon, said, if you want your faith to be effective, acknowledge, accept, and admit every good thing that is in you by Christ Jesus. Do you see that? It's right there in the Word. And how often do we say, if it's written, then our uncertainty is unnecessary. When I accept what the Bible has said of me, that is not arrogance. That's confidence. Because it's not me that made it come to pass, it's Him. I never could have paid the way. I never could have paved the way. I never could have gotten here. But through His grace, He has made me whole. And so my faith accepts it and admits it and acknowledges it. Right? Let me read you this same verse out of the Amplified. Paul said, And I pray that the participation in and sharing of your faith may produce and promote full recognition and appreciation and understanding and precise knowledge of every good thing that is ours. Do you see that? In our identification with Christ Jesus and unto His glory. So when I acknowledge who He has made me to be, it ain't giving me the glory. It's giving Him the glory. Because the work He did was a good work, and it's a finished work, and I accept it and acknowledge it. Well, what's that got to do with letting the king do his thing? We can't walk around talking about how impoverished we are, how poor we are, how insignificant we are, and how meaningless our lives if we believe he's given us a kingdom. Wait now, you see y'all. See, because what we've been taught is humility is actually stupidity dressed in religious clothes. We thought it's humble to speak and belittle ourselves because after all, we don't want to speak highly of themselves because no, no one ought to believe or suppose of themselves more highly than they ought. Well, that's true. You ought not to think more highly of yourself than you ought, but you ought to think in line with the Word. Because thinking more highly of myself than I ought is thinking that God has done what he's done because of how good I am. Look at me. Look at what I deserve. I spent a thousand hours praying in tongues and now the Lord bent heaven to my will. No, 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 no. That's arrogance. You're saying that you made God conform to your will through the sheer power of your prayers. You see, that's thinking of yourself more highly than you ought. Well, I'm more blessed than you because God loves me more because I give greater gifts. I work harder in the sanctuary. Do you see, now that's thinking more highly of myself than I ought to. I shared this with you, I think it was the week before last, that uh, humility is always in direct proportion to our understanding of grace. When I don't think much of grace, it's easy to think much of myself. But the more I acknowledge the grace of God, look at what He's done, look how large His love, look at how great His generosity, look at all the things He's done for me. That's, that does not create within me a sense of arrogance. That really creates within me a sense of humility. Now it's in my humility that I acknowledge and accept all that God has done. Right. 
It's arrogance really to stand in defiance of the word and say, well, I ain't nothing, when he said he gave you the kingdom. Yeah. It's a greater sign of humility to admit he gave me a kingdom. Yeah. Do you see this? It's not arrogance to say he did what he did. That is humility. Right. Well, how did you become a king within a kingdom? Because he appointed me. Yeah. How did you deserve it? That's the whole point. I didn't deserve nothing. But his grace, his grace was greater than my tragedy. His grace was greater than my needs. When I, he found me broken, he made me whole. When he found me unloved, he welcomed me. When he found me dirty, he kissed me. He did all these things. Yes, now I just stand in absolute humility and acknowledge, look at what the Lord has done. Now, the spiritually illiterate and the scripturally ignorant will look at you and say, well, now you're just full of pride. No, it ain't pride. It's confidence that his word is true. So I can stand in the middle of my trial and declare myself a victor. I can stand in the middle of my pain and declare myself more than a conqueror. I can stand surrounded by need and declare that he has met all of my needs according to his riches and glory. Because my environment does not alter my confession, because my confession is not built on my environment. My confession is built upon his word, and as long as that's unchanging, so then is my confession. Do you see that? So some people, well, that, well, you ought to just admit you're in a hard place. I'm not denying it, I'm just appealing to a greater truth of who I am in him. Amen? Everyone say, let the king. Do his thing. Don't think that somehow you're pleasing God by resisting his word. If he says, I love you, then just say, I am loved. Do you always feel love? No, not always. But I am always loved. Mm. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with today's message. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 20. So as it, when we're turning there, we need to confess and say out loud constantly, the kingdom is mine. When you're faced with, when you're faced with needs, you ought to say the entirety of the kingdom is mine. Right? Because what's in the kingdom? Every resource you would ever need. All the insight, all the revelation, all of the anointing, all of the power. It's all in the kingdom, and the kingdom's been given to you. And you know where you can go boldly in a time of need or a time of trouble? To the throne of grace. Boldly, you go right to the throne. Why? Because the kingdom is yours. Do you know what I do when I go home? I walk in. Ah, I see y'all in here. Now, if I go to your house, and it ain't my house, I might stand outside and wait and beg. And plead for your sympathy. I don't mind because you mean that much to me. I ain't too proud to beg. But when I go to my house, I ain't waiting on nothing. Because I got the keys. So it's my house. When I'm hungry, you know what I do to my refrigerator? I open it, and if it's there and my wife hasn't written on it, do not touch mine, because I've learned. If it ain't spelled out, do not eat, I partaketh, and I partaketh delightfully. So much so that she has to hide the Girl Scout cookies. But you get the point. If the kingdom is ours, then I don't stand outside the gates and put on religious clothes and beg God to accept me and beg God to meet my needs and beg God to give me a little bit more faith and beg God to give me a little bit more strength and beg God to do this or beg God to do that. I walk boldly into the kingdom and I helpeth my selfeth to what's in there. Well, pastor, you can't do that. Oh, yes, I can, and we all should. Do you remember the story of the prodigal son, which is really the story of a loving father? 
and that there were two sons in that story. And the eldest son, which never strayed and stayed home and worked diligently in the field, his one complaint was, and all the time that I've served you, you never gave me. You never gave me. And the father said, it was always yours. See, we read the story and we miss that, and it's probably the most important part of it. It was always yours. At any time, you could have killed the lamb and had a feast. At any time. Because everything I have has always been yours. So it wasn't the father withholding. It was the attitude and the mindset of the son. See, Christians are not beggars. Christians are proclaimers. Christians are declarers. We declare a thing and it shall be so. Because the anointing is in the declaration. Believing, is this okay this morning? I believe, therefore I speak. Hmm. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God making his appeal, as it were, through us. We, as Christ's personal representatives, do you see that? We, as Christ's personal representatives, beg you, for his sake, to lay hold of the divine favor now offered you and be reconciled to God. I want to spend a few minutes, actually the rest of the service, focusing on this office that he has given us as ambassadors. Because ambassadors are a very unique position. In every governmental body, throughout the ages, in the old days they used to call them emissaries, We call them ambassadors, but they're very unique in what they do, in the perks that are given them, and in how they get their office. Okay? So I want to just give you ten points about ambassadors because each one applies to us because you and I are ambassadors of a kingdom. We're not paupers. We're ambassadors. Everywhere we go... Every person we meet, every environment we encounter, we go there as personal representatives of the light. Personal representatives of Christ. And you remember Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because as he was given a kingdom, one was assigned to him, he's assigned it to us. He came to earth as a personal representative of God. Man had a very distorted image of who God was. In ancient Israel, they saw God as a great judge. Jesus came saying, I did not come to judge the world, but that through me the world might be reconciled. He came not as a judge, but as a reconciler. To join man back to the kingdom he lost. The message of Jesus Christ was one of a kingdom. Repent, he said, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He came preaching a kingdom. Mm. All right, number one. Well, before I give you number one, let me say this. Ambassadors have unique responsibilities and perks. Ambassadors, listen to this, always, this is not number one, ambassadors always serve their purpose on foreign soil. You know, the Bible says of you and I that we are strangers, aliens. This isn't our land. I don't even care if you were born in America. When you got a new identity in Christ, this became foreign soil. So now you're here as an ambassador. You follow me? 
they leave their homeland for another land, but they do not assimilate into the culture of that foreign land. They're in, but not of. All right, number one, an ambassador is always appointed. And their appointment, you got to hear this. Their appointment is based on relationship as the only qualification. God, listen, listen. How do you think Shirley Temple became an ambassador? Y'all remember Shirley Temple? Cute, little, curly-haired girl. Became an ambassador, right? What was her training to be an ambassador? An ambassador is chosen based on relationship. Relationship is the qualification. And there's a really important reason for that that will unfold. But the number one reason is that as an ambassador, my commitment must be to the one who appointed me. My commitment cannot be to my rank, my office, my title, or the land in which I serve because I serve at the pleasure of the one who appointed me. And the one who appointed me as a representative because they knew that my commitment, remember I told you a couple of weeks ago, it's always a question of devotion. If my devotion is to an office, be it apostle, prophet, or pastor, then I'm not an ambassador anymore. Because as an ambassador, my devotion is to the one who appointed me. Because wherever I go, I must forsake rank and office and position to be the personal representative of the one who appointed me. This is the reason why relationship is the, really the only qualification. Because I know, Cleve, if your devotion is to me, you'll never betray me. But if your devotion is to a position I give you, you'll throw me under the bus to keep that position. Right? Yep. But if my devotion is to the one who appointed me, the rank in the title is unimportant. The only thing that's important is am I representing to the fullest of my ability in word and in deed the one who sent me? See, this is where Jesus served the house of God even better than Moses did. Because there was not one time Jesus could say, I only speak what I hear the Father say. In fact, he said, I don't speak of my own initiative. I don't speak of my own accord. If I give you an opinion, it's the Father's opinion. Why? Because Jesus came as a direct representation. So as ambassadors, you ask me my opinion, I am going, if I don't know the kingdom's position on what you're asking me, I'm mute. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you an answer out of the emotional realm. I'm not going to speak my mind. Y- y'all follow me this morning. Not if I'm an ambassador. If I'm an ambassador and you ask me my position on a cultural or a national problem and I don't know the kingdom's position, I'm going to go to a place called a prayer closet. I'm going to bow my knee to the Father and I'm going to say, Lord, what do I tell them? And then in this position, I'm going to find out what the Father's response is And I'm going to come to you and say, thus saith the Lord. Is this okay this morning? See, as ambassadors, and if you've ever been to a foreign land for any length of time, you know ambassadors, man, they got it made. And I'm I'm going to unravel some of this in a little bit because in the near decade that my wife and I spent as missionaries, I've been to several different embassies and I stood in awe of the ambassadors. In fact, can I just admit, I was envious and jealous and angry because they had things I couldn't access. They had perks I couldn't get because they were ambassadors. Mm. Mm. Number two, an ambassador always represents the homeland. While serving, listen to this, 
while serving, they are the visible representative of the invisible king who sent them. If we have an ambassador in Pakistan, they may never see our president. Are y'all here this morning? But when they see the ambassador, the ambassador serves in that land as if they were the president. They always represent the homeland. Righteousness, you have heard me say many times, has two sides. Right? We've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. You and I are no longer unrighteous people. We may time to time as we're training ourselves to walk according to the spirit and not according to the flesh. We may do unrighteous things, but that does not make us unrighteous people. If we sin, the Bible says, we confess our sins to him and he forgives us. Right? We are made righteous not by our deeds, but we're made righteous by his blood. Righteousness has two sides, just like every coin has two sides. On one side, righteousness gives me the ability to go boldly before the throne of grace without any sense of shame or condemnation because I can go before God just as if I had never sinned. You following me? If, if I understand righteousness, it removes all sense of condemnation because I'm no longer what I did. I am who he made me. So now I'm welcome before the throne of grace and I go to it boldly. But the other side is this, and this is what I want you to hear. Righteousness always and uh, or also allows me to stand before broken people as God. As his representative. Why, as a believer, are we afforded the privilege of laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover? Because when we stand before the sick, we stand there as a representative of Christ. What would Christ do in the presence of sickness? Would he wax eloquent about the scriptures and then explain how that disease is their cross to bear? And if they bear it gladly, they'll be rewarded, welcome in heaven? Is that what he did when he walked the planet? No. So what he did is what we're supposed to do. Now, the only thing that holds us back, and can I, for years it held me back, a sense of unworthiness. I would never lay my hands upon the sick because I knew how unworthy I was. That's ego. But one day God put me in the middle of Siberia and I had no one else to help me. When the sick came to me, I couldn't, I couldn't, she wasn't even there. I was by myself. I had no one to help me, so I couldn't step back and say, Brother Cleve, would you? No, no, I had to do it. And you know what I discovered? Despite my sense of unworthiness and, and, and the trepidation, God is God and God is good. And I laid my hands on the sick and I saw them recover. I was more surprised than they were. I mean, I would step back and that, I would never, I wouldn't let them see me sweat. But I would step back and go, oh my God. You did it. Can we do it again? Right? But the only thing that holds us back from being bold is we're unaware of who he has made us to be. But as we fold back each piece of deception and we divorce ourselves from our history and we begin to see that I really am who he has made me to be and that I am altogether righteous, I am altogether lovely, I am altogether loved, I am completely whole, I am in this earth even as he has made me to be and he has made me to be just like him. That's the truth that sets us free from all confinement. That's the truth that sets us free to go out into a world and proudly proclaim in humility, look how good God is. Is this, is this okay? So righteousness allows me to stand before broken people even as God would. 
with all the power and the authority of the king, we present his will to the people of the land we serve. The duty, listen to this, the duty of the ambassador is to verbalize and advance the interest of the homeland. I want to say that again. The duty of the ambassador is to verbalize and advance the interest of the homeland. In John chapter 6, verse 38, our, our master said this, For I have come down from heaven, the homeland. Do you see that? I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Hmm. Number three. Ooh, I got to hurry up. An ambassador is committed only to the homeland's interest, not self-interest. A good ambassador recognizes that all they have been given, all the perks are to empower them to advance the interest of the king they represent. While on kingdom missions, they seek only what the king would seek if the king were in their place. They're committed only to the king's interest. Years ago, my wife and I were sanctioned by a large American ministry to go to London and represent them because they wanted to establish an office in the UK and buy television time. So we were living in Krakow, Poland at the time, but because they commissioned us to go to London on their behalf, we were in London, I think, two weeks. And the whole time we were there, we never spoke of our ministry. Not one time did we ever tell anyone what we were doing. We were there as ambassadors. So we only represented, and we met some of the biggest owners of television stations, some of the largest, the pastors of the largest churches, but the only thing we spoke about was the ministry we were representing. And I think it might, it might have been the last day when all of our work was done, the owner of the television station took us out to dinner, and he asked us, I think, what we were doing the next day, and we said, well, we're getting on a plane to go home. And he asked us where we lived, thinking that we lived somewhere in the States, and we said, well, we're going back to Krakow, Poland. And he said, wait, I thought you were Americans. I said, well, we are. He said, then what are you doing going to Poland? I said, well, that's where we live, right? Up until that point, he never knew where we lived. He never knew that we were missionaries. He never knew that we had our own interests, ambitions, and goals. Because while I'm representing the one who sent me, I only speak of what the one who sent me wants. And when he found out we were missionaries, he said, why have you never told me this? He said, I've been wanting to meet some missionaries so that we could develop an entire program around a missionary and we could send cameras with you everywhere you go and we could have an international television program about you. Wow. Even then, we refused to speak about that. Yeah. We told him we can't even talk about that yeah. because that's self-interest. Yeah. And we're only here... For them. Amen. Are y'all following me? Yes, Seek first yes. the kingdom yes. of God. Yes. Yes. Seek first in everything you do. What does the Father want? In this relationship, what does the Father want? In this undertaking, what does the Father want? In this business venture, what does the Father want? In this opportunity, what does the Father want? In this adversity, what does the Father want? Yes, Seek first the kingdom of God. Yes and his righteous way of doing things, and all of these things will be added to you. You're following me? If an ambassador does their job, they'd never betray their own opinion. They never reveal their own interest. Because as long as they're representing the king, that's all they talk about. And as long as they seek first the interest of the king, they lack for nothing. Are y'all with me? See, we are the ambassadors of Christ. We just got to put that at the forefront of our mind. Yes. We are here on this planet for however long we are to represent a king. Yes. Amen. My only ambition is to represent him. Amen. My only goal is to make him famous. Right. 
And when that becomes our goal, everything will be added to you. You'll not lack for anything. Now, come on now, is this okay this morning? While we were in London, listen to this. Our, everywhere we stayed was paid for. Every meal we ate was paid for. Everything we needed was paid for. Because we weren't there on our own. We were there for another. And we had every right to expect that they would pay for it. When you and I have only one ambition, and that is to do His will, then we never need have a doubt, will He pay the bill? Are y'all following me this morning? I want to say that again. If we have only one ambition, and that is to do His will, then we never need have a doubt, will He pay the bill? We used to hear it all the time. I think it started with Brother Hagin. Where He guides, He provides. God is faithful. He'll watch over His word and His work to perform it and supply it. Is this okay this morning? Number four, they are totally covered by the state. They're totally covered. Years ago, once again, I'm hearkening back to when we were missionaries. My wife and I visited some other missionaries in Germany. And when we arrived at their house, and I didn't know that the wife worked for the State Department, but when we arrived at their house, I was greeted by an absolute vision of loveliness something that was so perfect in design and beautiful and wonderful to behold, I'd almost forgotten about it. But when I saw it, I was flooded with emotions because there on the table sat Oreo cookies. And if you've ever wondered what is sheer perfection, in the cookie world, it's an Oreo. It's, especially if you, get, if you get into the double stuff, you've got to admit it's the perfect ratio of cream to wafer. And when you put it in a cold cup of milk, never has there been a more perfect design. It'll float for a minute, but have your fork ready. Because as soon as it starts to sink and the letters are about to go below the waves of the milk, you got to catch it. Because right then it, it has absorbed the perfect amount of milk. I had, for, I had, I had, I had, had to enjoy crackers from England and they're okay but they ain't an Oreo there were no Oreos to the peasants but when we got to the king's house there were Oreos enough it was like manna man and I had to know where how and how much because my wife always jokes she said I would have paid $50 for a single Oreo cookie she doesn't know I would have gone higher. <laughs> but they had Oreos, and I didn't know how they had Oreos because Tesco didn't have Oreos. Tesco is a, a, an English store, and whatever, where, car, car four, none of them had Oreos. There were no Oreos to be had, and of course, we had to bring back things like detergent and other things. We couldn't put Oreos in my backpack. She wouldn't allow it. But they had Oreos, and then I discovered that as someone who worked within the State Department for the ambassador, they had access to this thing called a commissary. And in this commissary, they had Doritos, they had Fritos, they had Oreos, and they had all the O's that would make you say, oh my. And they could go freely into the commissary because the commissary had within it everything their homeland had. If it was for sale in America, they could get it in that land. What's that got to do with us? Does not the Bible say he'd meet all of your needs according to his riches in glory? See, ah, oh, come on, now I'm preaching better. Maybe it's just you're absorbing this. For too long, we've looked at what was available around us. We thought, well, I can only access what's in my immediate environment. And then, then we get depressed if we think, well, the economy's going to collapse, you know, because all the jobs are going down and everything's going down, and so we go down with it, and we think, well, I only can access what's around me. If we would understand we are in this world but not of this world, 
and we are truly ambassadors of a king who owns everything, then all we need to do is enter in by faith to the commissary and say, I think I'll have me an Oreo mega stuff. Y'all ever had a mega stuff? We were in Publix and they had mega stuff. I overdosed on mega stuff. I think it's time that you and I learn to overdose on the goodness of God. Just you listen. Is this okay this morning? I got a lot. I got a lot to go. But you need to remember, God doesn't only do what you need; He does what you want. The very first miracle of the ministry of Jesus Christ had nothing to do with need. Did I just lose you? What was the first miracle? Wine at a wedding. Did they need wine? No, they'd already had wine. Were they going to die without wine? Were they going to be naked without wine? Were they going to be orphaned without wine? No, then why do wine just to keep the party going on? The very first miracle wasn't about need. It was about pleasure. You see how far religion has distorted our image of our father? We thought he would only barely give us enough just to keep us alive. Keep us crawling one more day. And then eventually, pray to the Lord, eventually we'll cross the finish line. I'll barely make it, but someday I'll get it. No, 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 bro, you are supposed to walk, not crawl. Be blessed the whole, brother, is it, man, I don't know if I'm helping you. But I'm helping, brother Hagen said we used to have a, we need a little bit of heaven to go to heaven with. The gospel is the good news, not the barely make it news. Number five is the responsibility of the state. The ambassador's welfare is the responsibility of the state. The homeland has a duty. Everyone say duty. duty. The homeland has a duty to supply the ambassador with everything they need to accomplish their job. Their welfare is the responsibility of the homeland. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, just looking at the very first part of the verse, it says, who serves in the military at his own expense? Who serves in the kingdom of our Christ at their own expense? You see, very too often we have our eyes on what we have to give up instead of what he wants to give us. We should never go before God with our idea about what it is we have to give him. We should always go before God with the idea of what it is he wants to give us. Because what he wants to give you for whatever little sacrifice he asks you to make far outweighs in both value and scope whatever it is you give him. You will never outgive God, not in your time. You'll never outgive God, not in your resources. You'll never, God will be indebted to no man. If you give God out of that place, that motive called love, a thousand dollars, it will be the best thousand dollars you ever spent. If you give to God out of that place called love 10 hours of your time, then he'll redeem a hundred hours of your labor. Because your welfare is his responsibility. I've already quoted it to you, Philippians chapter 4, my God will supply some of your needs. Well, you all must be reading it out of the wrong translation, because my translation says some of your needs every once in a while, and you never know when. No, oh, I got the wrong one. Throw that one out. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Did he not say in John chapter 15, but if you live in life, listen to this, John chapter 15, verse 7, the Passion Translation. If you live in life union with me, and if my words live powerfully within you, then you can ask whatever you desire and it will be done. When your lives bear abundant fruit, you demonstrate that you are my mature disciples who glorify my Father. Hmm. I need to hurry up. We're at 10 after. Let's go to number six. I'm skipping some things, but if you go to the Bible app, you'll have all of my notes. 
and you can see each one, all the things that I'm skipping, and then you can send me an email and say, Pastor, you shouldn't have skipped that. <laughs> Number six, they are totally protected by the state. Each and every embassy I'd ever seen was not guarded by local militia. When I went to our embassy in Warsaw, Poland, you know who greeted me at the gate? United States Marines. Are y'all listening to me? Because that embassy was guarded by soldiers from the homeland. Why? Because that was an outpost of the United States. That was American soil. Psalm 91, verse 11. For he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. So do you know, even if you can't see him, everywhere you go, every place your foot treads, every every place you visit, you have guards to the front, you have guards to the rear, you have guards on both sides. And they're guards that are sent from the homeland to protect you, and they're just a wee bit better than United States Marines. They're called heavenly angels. And they're with you all the time. Right now, you're guarded. Right now, ain't nobody wants to mess with me. Amen. Not because I'm a bad man. I am. <laughs> you can see it in my walk. No, but I got angels. And they'll protect you. And you know what? My wife and I have had, we have had, had to be angelic visitations when we were traveling across the nations. And there were times when we were in danger. Yet somehow nothing ever happened. As ambassadors of heaven, you're guarded by heaven's host. And then in 2 Kings chapter 6, the Bible is a reality, y'all, not fiction. In 2 Kings chapter 6, and I'm going to hurry up through the rest of these. Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elijah prayed and said, O Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Do you think it would be any less for you than it was for Elisha? No, it would be absolutely more. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 26, Don't you realize that I could ask my Father for thousands of angels to protect us, and he would send them instantly. You are totally covered by homeland security. Number seven, ambassadors never become citizen of the state or land to which they are signed. In John chapter 17, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And this is a big one. They never become part of the culture to which they are sent. Listen to this. They are to affect, not be infected. Their relevancy in the land they serve is not based by adaption to the culture. Their relevancy is based upon the nature of their mission. An ambassador, is an, especially of an important land, is never considered an irrelevant one because their relevancy is based upon the nature of their mission. They don't adapt to the customs and traditions or the language of the land in which they serve. If the economy of the land they collapse, serve collapses, they do not go down with it. If the leadership of the land they serve changes, it does not change or alter their purpose. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. My divinely loved friends, since you are resident aliens and foreigners in this world, I appeal to you to divorce yourselves from the evil desires that wage war within you. Don't become like the place you serve. Number eight. Can only be recalled by the head of state. They don't need the applause of the residents in the land they serve because they don't serve according to their pleasure. They serve according to the pleasure of the king who sent them. So they cannot be recalled by the head of state. What does this mean? No one can appoint you. No one can demote you. That You don't need everyone's applause. You only need his permission. Yes, sir. Number nine. And I already covered this a little bit, so I'm going to speed through it. Never speaks his personal position on any issue, only his homeland's official position. 
In John chapter 12, for I did not speak of my own initiative, but the Father himself, the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. And I like this out of the Passion Translation. He says, for I'm not speaking as someone who is self-appointed, mm. but I speak by the authority of the Father himself who sent me and who instructed me what to say. Number 10, and we'll close with this. His goal, the goal of the ambassador, is to influence the territory for his kingdom government. From the time Jesus began to preach, he would say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As ambassadors of the kingdom of our Christ, you and I have a most unique position. Our livelihood is not based, nor does it come from the land in which we serve. We can serve in an impoverished land and not be impoverished. We can serve in a violent land and it not come near us. Because we are in a world that is hostile, at each other's throats, dog eat dog, filled with hate. But we have this thing. Ambassadors enjoy it called diplomatic immunity. immunity. You and I have a thing called divine immunity. No weapon formed against us can prosper. And every word spoken over us in judgment, we can condemn. Because our livelihood, our welfare, our status, and our provision all come from our homeland. Stand to your feet. We're going to receive our offering in just a moment, and then you'll be dismissed. If you need prayer this morning, our, our prayer team will be up here to pray for you, but I want to read this verse to you again. We are, everyone say, I am. I am. Paul said we are, not we're going to be someday. We are Christ ambassadors. Yes. So lift your hand and say, Father, I accept. And I acknowledge my appointment. I will serve you faithfully every moment of every day, everywhere I go. I will acknowledge and proclaim I am your ambassador. I am here to represent you. Every word I say, everything I do to represent you. For I acknowledge and I accept my appointment as an ambassador for the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Go ahead and give the Lord a hand clap of praise. I don't know, I don't know what you call a gathering of ambassadors other than something really important. Amen. So this morning as we...